Thanks very much, uh, and good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Today, I want to set out my reflections on three key parts of my portfolio as Culture Secretary. They are potential, opportunity, and freedom. That is, unlocking the potential that exists in the industries my department represents, including the creative industries. Ensuring DCMS and government as a whole supports opportunities for young people. And thirdly, highlighting the challenges to press freedom and identifying the principles by which we need to resolve those challenges. Before I turn to those thoughts, I want to spend a moment talking about delivery. Because you will know that we have a Prime Minister who is laser focused on delivery. And he appointed me 100 days ago to deliver on a number of projects that affect our communities. And I've taken that challenge to deliver very seriously. In that time, I've brought to fruition a number of previous commitments. They include a draft media bill with reforms to level the playing field for our public service broadcasters, a football white paper to protect our beautiful game, a gambling white paper that delivers for the smartphone age, millions of pounds to support youth facilities across the country, 100 million pounds to support our charities and 60 million pounds to upgrade our swimming pools, an international summit setting out our opposition to Russian and Belarusian participation in international sporting events, as well as working with my department, the Royal Family and the BBC to deliver the coronation and the events surrounding it, as well as Eurovision, where we worked very closely with Liverpool. And now that I've delivered on those commitments, I want to lay out a clear agenda for the months ahead. One centred around potential, opportunity, and freedom. And I wanted to start by telling you a story about an absolutely brilliant woman called Yetta, who understood the importance of freedom, opportunity, and potential. Her parents were Russian and came to our free country as refugees fleeing persecution. And despite a number of potential drawbacks of that age, being Jewish, being a child of immigrants, and being a woman, she succeeded. Yetta ignored obstacles and focused instead on the opportunity she had been given to be brought up here in the UK and in her very own extensive potential. My grandmother, Yetta Fraser, became the first female barrister in Leicester and practiced at the bar until she was 80. And on every visit I made to see her, she reminded me of a line in a poem by Robert Browning. A man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? It's a line about believing in your ability to succeed and take advantage of the opportunity to realize your potential. It totally summed up her life, and it's my guiding principle in this role. My department gets to represent some of the very best of Britain. Musicians and songwriters like Adele and Ed Sheeran, world-class footballers, budding young writers and producers, video game creators and fashion designers. To my mind, DCMS is a department for talent and opportunity. And our industries are truly world-class. I represent so many companies that have understood their potential and done everything possible to maximize it. I just wanted to take two examples from companies here in this room. Sky, who launched in 1989 in a prefab structure in an industrial park in the fringes of West London. Today, Sky is among our leading entertainment companies with 23 million subscribers. Or Netflix, who was founded as a mail-order rental firm in the 90s and have evolved into a business that spent £4.8 billion in the UK in the last three years alone, making TV shows and films here and kick-starting long-term studio leases at Shepperton, Long Cross, and a new London headquarters opening last year. 
Indeed, our creative industries are world-class. They generated £108 billion in 2021. They employ over 2 million people across the country. And to put things in perspective, they are worth more than our life sciences, automotive manufacturing, aerospace, and the oil and gas sectors combined. We are in the global age of the silver screen. We rival any country in the world at sound and visual effects and are on track to double UK film stage space by 2025. And there is world over demand for high-end British productions. Not just because of our fantastic actors and our great locations, but because of our tech know-how and our production skills. The imagination of our designers, our producers, our content creators, our writers and our artists is spearheading growth right across our economy. But it's also owed in part to how government and industry have worked together to back talent in this country and make Britain one of the best places in the world to be creative. And I am here to continue to maximise that growing potential. This Conservative government has shown what can be achieved when we work with and listen to all of you in industry. It's that same model of public-private partnership that gave us a world-class vaccine development programme and rollout right across the country, that gave us a £1.5 billion COVID relief package during COVID that protected our cultural and creative industries, and a highly successful film and TV production restart scheme that ensured the industry was able to continue making great new content despite the lack of commercial insurance to cover COVID risk. Also the tax reliefs that have been a huge catalyst for growth for our creative industries. And I have no doubt that we in government can do more to support the creatives. But we can't simply rely on uh, the past formula for that past success. You will know that we face increasing global competition and we can't afford to be complacent. By turbocharging growth and investment in sectors like video games, visual effects, music, fashion, film and television and more, we can retain our status as a creative industry's superpower for decades to come. In order to do that, we need to maximise potential. So I am committing to growing the creative industries by an extra £50 billion by 2030 creating a million extra jobs all over the country by 2030 and delivering a creative careers promise that builds a pipeline of talent into our creative industries. And I want to work with you to deliver it. And I know we can, because we are fortunate to have a Prime Minister and a Chancellor who have identified this sector as one of five priority sectors for government and who have shown their commitment by taking action to support the industry. At the budget, the Chancellor backed our theatres, our museums, galleries, orchestras, film, high-end TV and video game sectors by extending and reforming tax reliefs that create jobs, drive growth and support talent. Over the next few months, we will be identifying how we can go even further. First, growing these sectors by promoting skills from primary school children to those returning to the workforce, whether that's in music at school or extracurricular activities, and working with the creative sector on maximising the opportunities of boot camps and apprenticeships. Secondly, we want to harness talent in clusters across the UK. And support can't be at the expense of London, or detract from those places that are already thriving. It needs to build on what we have already seen across the country, whether that's video games in Dundee and Lamington Spa, or TV in Birmingham and Leeds. And thirdly, targeting specific support at different subsectors to unlock growth across the UK. And now I'd like to turn to opportunity, particularly for young people. 
because we need inspired, empowered, and creative people to drive these industries forward in the future. And I want to ensure that young people, wherever they are, and whatever their backgrounds are, they have the opportunity to realize their potential and their dreams, just like Yetta did, for something better than the probable destiny of their background. Before taking up this role in DCMS, I was responsible for youth justice. I met many young people who had unfortunately gone down the wrong path. None of them intending or really wanting to. I remember meeting John, who'd struggled at school, dropped out of school, and then been sent to a young offenders institution. He said to me, I don't really understand why no one realized that I was struggling and that I needed help. I don't really understand why no one noticed me. Through a mentoring support scheme after he came out of prison, he got back on track. And he himself became a mentor to other young children. We already have the National Youth Guarantee, but I plan to expand that and offer and make central youth to how we do things as a department. We need to offer all young children inspiration, aspiration, a fulfilling education, hope, and support. And finally, freedom. As a descendant of someone who had to flee persecution for freedom, I appreciate what it means to live in a free society and how dangerous it is when those freedoms are threatened. Organizations in this room today play a vital role in protecting both our freedoms and our democracy. We often talk about freedom of the press, but the reality is that it's you, the media, who are helping to protect the freedom of others. You, who live up to the words of George Orwell, inscribed by his statue outside BBC Broadcasting House, that if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. And I recognize that this basic right is under threat across the world. The New York Times chairman told UNESCO earlier this month that all over the world, independent journalists and press freedoms are under attack. And he was right. Because you only need to look at the Russian arrest of a Wall Street Journal journalist to see that. I know that the challenges to, fee, to free, fair, and truthful reporting are coming from so many quarters. From the potential use, misuse of AI to miss and disinformation. Um, and that is even without mentioning the speed of the changing media landscape. Staying competitive in a rapidly changing environment is a challenge for everyone. Challenger companies like BuzzFeed and Vice that were once the new kids on the block are facing uncertain futures. As a government, we are taking steps to increase press freedoms and make sure that journalists can do their jobs effectively. With measures like the protection of public service broadcasters and prominence in the draft media bill, and our commitment to repeal Section 40, or the protection of journalists in the online safety bill, we are actively guarding your ability to uphold the rights of others. If we want to have a thriving media sector in the future, our focus has to be on a free press and a press that is free to grow. I know that that is a major focus of your discussions today, looking at what the future looks like for companies big and small. And through our draft media bill, we are updating a decades-old regulatory framework to level the playing field and help guarantee the long-term future of those first-class public service broadcasters, whilst also giving a broadcaster like Channel 4 even greater freedoms to produce, own, and sell outstanding British content across the globe. No government has all the answers to all the challenges that the media faces. But what I can promise you is that my approach will be guided 
by the following principles. Protecting our public service broadcasters. Standing up for independent voices and nurturing a thriving media landscape which upholds and champions fearless truth-telling. To finish, I want to end on a thought. Last Saturday, I enjoyed seeing the amazing cultural programme organised by Liverpool as the host city for Eurovision Song Contest, which showcased Ukrainian artists. I also celebrated with 7,000 others in the Liverpool arena at the grand final. Creative excellence, TV production at its finest, world-class BBC output. I was sitting next to the Ukrainian culture minister, and as the show started, Russia bombed Ukraine. He turned to me and said, it's surreal. He looked around at the glitter, the spectacle, and the sparkle, and he said, I am here, and my wife is in a bomb shelter in Ukraine. Here in the UK, we are lucky to have it all. Potential, opportunity, freedom. And we must embrace it. Because as my grandmother would have said, what's the heaven for? Thank you. Secretary of State, that was a wonderful projection of your personal passion and the backstory to it. Uh, and I think for everyone in the room, a very personal call to action around potential opportunity and freedom and what you see this industry offering. So thank you for that. Now I've got a couple of questions, and I may be able to come very quickly to the audience, but I'm in the red on the time box. But I'd like to ask some. If you had one highlight from your first uh, 100 days or so in office, what would it be? So I think the highlight must be the last week because we've had a combination in the last week of uh, how brilliant we are on the world stage and that is the coronation which was a combination of showing our excellence in the world. You know, 200 foreign dignitaries here. Um, we had you know, world-class creative content in the music uh, as well as Eurovision where we had you know, creative excellence yeah. as well and I think sometimes we undersell ourselves as the UK across the world they're always looking to us to lead it yeah. and I was so proud over the course of the last week to be British. That's wonderful and do you think I'm switching that the creative industries get the credit that they deserve for the economic heavyweight sector that you described? I, th I think they do now I think we have a prime minister as I mentioned and a chancellor who totally understand the power of the creative industries. And, and so they should. I mean, they're, um, they're, they're, double the rate, they're growing at double the rate of the rest of the economy. And so we, they're, a, they're an absolute superpower, and we need to support them. And we are doing so, whether that's through tax reliefs, you know, ensuring that we have the pipeline of skills. But I think now, um, I'm very lucky to be in this post, because I think we have a prime minister and a chancellor to whom the door is open. So I think you know, if we come up with uh, the right plan, I think we've got a, a government that is absolutely listening to the power of this sector. Okay, now let me just go to the floor. Is there any, are there any questions from the floor? I've got one over here, let me. Yes, please, can we have a mic, please? And for our timekeepers, we will keep it brief. Do we have a microphone? <laughs> I think the microphone is on its way. At speed. Thank you, microphone. Thanks. Thank you. It's uh, Jill Hine from Enders Analysis. Uh, do you think that traditional public service broadcasters can compete in the age of the streaming giants? Uh, I do, absolutely. I think, um, I think both have something to offer. And I think that, uh, for example, you know, the BBC and ITV are doing something very different to Netflix and Disney. Uh, say, you know, BBC obviously uh, has an, uh, an obligation to do British production for a British audience, as well as obviously 
uh, the World Service. But if you look at stats, like, for instance, uh, there is a really interesting stat that 69% of people um, have watched Netflix in the last year and 75% have used iPlayer. You can see that they can both survive in a very competitive en environment. But it's our job as government to ensure that we back both, that both can grow uh, in the competitive world that we have. Fabulous. We have time for one more question. I'll take in the middle, please. The lady with blonde hair waving. <laughs> Thank you. And then we will, for our timekeepers then, that will be the last question. Thank you. It's Kate Bulkley. You mentioned in your speech um, AI. Uh, this seems to be the theme that we're going to talk about a lot today. Even industry players are now calling for regulation of AI. How do you see this happening? How do you think it's going to get formulated? What role should government play in this? And how are you going to coordinate it internationally? Because it's, again, one of these issues that it's not just UK. I know that's a big question, but if you can yeah. give us some in views, that would be great. <laughs> and it'll be a nice in tight answer. In the out of time, <laughs> time that I have. Um, um, so AI is, what is both the, one of the biggest challenges and the biggest opportunity that, comes, that is coming down the path. And it's absolutely right that we work both uh, as a government, with industry, and internationally to think about these issues. Um, so DFIT, um, the Department for Science and Innovation, has already done a report on uh, AI uh, and is, of course, looking at uh, regulation. I'm very concerned, as the Secretary of State, uh, for culture, media, and sport to ensure that we uh, protect original creative works, whether that's in the creative industries, whether that's news, we need to ensure that you get fair compensation uh, for the work that you are doing. But this is something that we all need to work together on. There are absolutely no easy answers to this question. Um, and it's something that, as a government, we're looking very, very closely at. Thank you. And Secretary of State, thank you. We're sadly going to have to call the questions to a close there.